name is Hua Win. My husband wasn't able to join us, um, but he's AKA my lover, Jaime Gonzalez. And then Maria Coleman, she is the executive director of investor relations. Um, our company is called Black Steel Investment Group. We were prior, uh, we rebranded to this. Prior to that, we were 2020 Platinum Capital. So currently our portfolio, uh, we have 460 million asset under management. Uh, we have over 6,000 units across 23 different apartment communities. Um, my husband and I currently live in Plano, suburb of DFW area. And so the bulk of our portfolio is in DFW and Houston. Um, and we do have a property out in South Carolina. Um, but the Texas market, as you guys probably know, uh, from California, we have a lot of movement into the Texas market. And so that's really been driving up uh, multifamily even more. So what is a multifamily syndication? So a multifamily syndication, essentially, to kind of say it in a nutshell, easy, is just when a group of investors we all pull our money together to purchase a larger apartment building, something that we probably couldn't do on our own unless it's a smaller multifamily. Most of the projects that we focus on is usually 150 units to about 360 units. And so our properties uh, are usually within 26 million to 70 million range. And so, you know, Jaime alone, um, and I wouldn't be able to purchase a property like that. So the, the beauty of it is being able to partner with other general partners in, and then also have passive investors uh, pull money together in order to buy these larger assets. And so when you break down the general partnership team, and there's different terminology, sometimes you'll hear general partners, sometimes you'll hear sponsors, uh, but Essentially, the general partners or sponsors are really the active ones doing the work. The limited partners is truly just investing the capital and leveraging the work of the general partners and the sponsorship team to actively do all the work. And so as far as the deal flow and the market analysis and the due diligence and all the work that goes involved with operations, um, that's really the general partners doing all the work and the passive investors um, are really, it's truly hands off done for you real estate investing. And so the three main pillars of the multifamily syndication is gonna be acquisition. And so the acquisition process, I mean, that's underwriting the deal um, getting to know the brokers, doing the market analysis. Uh, it's really important during the acquisition phase um, instead of just pulling the two big reports are CoStar and Yardi. And they tell you very detailed statistics of what the market is doing, what the sales comparables and rent comparables are in that area. But to be honest, for us, it's so important to be boots on the ground and to have partners who are, are experienced operators and asset managers within that market, because they're going to be really the ones that are um, um, have a better feel for that particular sub market. And so that's super important with acquisitions when you do rent comps to not just go on those reports, because those reports are usually going to be a little bit more outdated. And so we always want to make sure when we're looking at upgrades and we're looking at amenities and we're looking at, so comparing apples to apples, looking at the management, looking at the location, looking at, so there's a lot of different things during that acquisition phase uh, that's super important. And you want to know a good insurance broker, you want to know a good lender um, and have those connections during that acquisition phase. Um, and an experienced team is going to be able to leverage better debt and it's going to be able to really get better um, rates and have more connections. Um, the equity component is really the money, right? And so the debt, um, right now, we used to do debt coverage about 75 to 80, depending on the market. And post-COVID, and especially now, we're really cutting that down to maybe 60 to about 70 max uh, on the equity. And that comes from the lender which means that the remaining 30 to 35% of that amount 
is going to be private capital that we're going to be raising from investors. And so the general partnership team is going to put their own money. And that's important that the general partnership team does have skin in the game and put their own equity in, in addition to raising capital for that project. And then operations. I mean, that's huge to be able to, I mean, all the numbers can look great and dandy, but if you don't have a strong operational team to execute the business plan, then that's a problem. And especially right now, because in the past, when the market is hot, you know, you could, you could be a poor operator and the property will still perform and appreciate because the market and the rent growth organically was just riding so high. Now, more than ever, operations is super important and having a team that is strong in asset manage and operations and boots on the ground and knowing that submarket very well. And so all our properties and most people who do syndications will have a third party professional management company. And so there is not going to be you're not going to be the landlord. Um, uh, like a single family. And some single family, you'll have a property management company. But with the larger properties, you know, you can pay and negotiate um, the fee structure to probably be about 2.75 to 3.25% for the property management and have really good choices and more options to have really good management teams. But you really need to have someone on your general partnership team be a good asset manager who's going to have weekly calls and you know with the property management company and really deep dive into the financials to make sure that things are being done and executed properly okay and so why multifamily syndications you know multifamily like i talked about earlier whether you want to be a passive investor or you want to be an active investor there are a lot of different strategies and so if you want to be purely passive, then you can do that. If you want to start passive and transition, learn the ropes, and then eventually become a co-GP or co-general partner and partner with someone more experienced to learn the ropes, you can do that. You can do a syndication. Or if you have a smaller multifamily, you might decide to just do a JV, uh, also known as a joint venture, and maybe have three or four people put their equity together and work on that project without having to raise capital uh, from other investors. So there are different ways of being able to do that. Or you can purchase one outright by yourself if you have the equity and you can buy an 11 unit or 14 unit, you know, and there's pros and cons of that, right? That means that you're going to be doing most of the work, right? So that's very active and you're not going to be able to leverage someone else with more experience uh, to be able to do that. And the property management, when you go on smaller properties, you are going to be limited a little bit more on which property management companies are going to take on the smaller properties. And you will be paying a higher uh, fee for those property management companies to do that. Um, the valuation of a property in multifamily is really different than in single family. You know, in single family, the rent comps and if you go in and you really do all the bells and whistles to upgrade a property, you know, you're limited really kind of to the, the rent and the sales comparables and the MLS around your market there. And, and in multifamily, when you're doing an apartment, if you have an opportunity to increase what's called the NOI, which is the net operating income. Essentially, that means it's the profit margin. So if you're able to increase the income and decrease the expenses and that NOI and that profit margin is called forced appreciation. And in a three to five year period, that's typically most syndications as a, you know, we underwrite it for about a five year model and you're able to appreciate that value and sell it higher, um, the valuation of the property is if you can do that NOI increase, your property is going to be valued as such. And so that is a big advantage of how um, those are evaluated. You can sell those. So upsides and downsides. So every investment um, has risks, right? And so the upsides and the downsides of a multifamily, especially for like, say, syndications. So, you know, the upside is you're going to get, even as a passive investor, 
you get all the advantages just like a true active investor without having to do the work. And so you do still get the cash flow, you get the appreciation, you get the tax advantages, the scalability, and you get to leverage an experienced team without you kind of fumbling and making a lot of mistakes. You get to leverage a general partnership team who's boots on the ground and doing all the work and you still get the monthly reporting. And so depending on the general partnership team and what you want to be um, you know, really good about as a passive investor is making sure that you can trust the sponsorship team to be transparent with financial reporting. And so the property management team uh, will provide a, a very detailed report of all the numbers. Um, and most syndicators should be able to share those with the passive investors and give a high level monthly report of how the property is doing. But also if a passive investor wants to deep dive into the financials to see where the cash flow and how much is being spent every single month, I really believe that uh, you should have that ability to do, to do that. And so as a passive investor who has the aspiration of wanting to go active one day, you can learn quite a ton from being just even a passive investor and learning the ropes and seeing those financial reports and updates and seeing how the property works. Um, the cash flow that ranges depending on what asset class you're in, um, and typically they are they're either monthly or quarterly, and cash distributions after about six months of closing a property is typically when you'll get uh, distribution started. But each team will let you know typically when cash flow distributions should start. It's going to be longer if it's a new development project, if it's already stabilized and cash flowing from the get-go, then normally, you know, six months after six months is pretty normal. If you do before that, it's gravy you know, three to six months, some teams and some of our own projects, we've been able to do three to six months, but we like to rather just say six after six months. And if we're able to do it sooner, uh, then that's great. Some of the downsides are, you know, when you invest, your money is not liquid until the property is sold. And so sometimes your money is invested uh, for that time period for that three to five year whole period. And so your money stays in there. Um, and then for certain situations, someone can buy you out. Like if you have an emergency type situation, especially personally with us, if you had something you're like, hey, I really need that money out, then some either we can have another investor buy your share out um, or we would personally buy it out. But you have shares of ownership of that LLC. Uh, control is by the sponsorship team. So the general partnership teams are really going to make the decisions on what they're going to do on that project. And of course, let the investors know what's going on, good or bad. And sometimes they'll ask the opinion of the passive investors and get feedback. But really, a passive investor does not truly have um, control. Uh, the minimum capital to start typically with a syndication is 50 to 100,000. There are exceptions where sometimes you can go in lower for 25,000, but most projects will uh, are going to be more 50 to 100,000. So why invest now? And so, you know, I'll tell you a perfect reason, kind of like we closed on two projects and this is just um, very recent, but, you know, inflation, I mean, that's, that's been the topic everywhere, right? Inflation's on the rise. And so if you're talking about about 9% inflation or whatnot, um, money, if you're letting that sit, if you have liquid capital that's just sitting in the bank, that's actually losing value, right? And so when you, when you put that money to work for you and invest, like in a savings account in a bank or anything, I mean, it's barely zero point whatever percent. Um, and then you count inflation on that, your money's really losing. And then you put it in the market. I mean, there's volatility in the market. So I think that the beauty of multifamily is it's more stabilized. It, you know, you'll have more stabilized cash flow. And if you hold real estate, um, especially if you buy in the right market, um, 
especially population growth and job growth, those type of sunbelt markets and things. Um, and there's other markets you can research that are, it has to meet landlord friendly, be good population growth, have good economic job growth, um, and have household incomes that are able to afford that. Uh, especially if you have a business plan and you're in an area where the household income doesn't support that type of growth, that's not going to work. And so those are things you do have to, of course, take into account. But if you buy right, um, real estate is going to, it's going to appreciate. And right now, especially with apartments, the demand is so high and the supply is low. And when you're talking about inflation, building cost is going to be higher. Labor cost is higher. And so to develop and build new apartments um, is going to be, it's going to cost more. And so existing apartments there, um, you know, organic rent growth, because the demand is there, you're going to actually do better in the rent market. And when housing is harder, when people can, it's harder for people to own a home because of the inflation and because of in interest rate increases, where now there's that affordability gap, again, that causes people to rent more than to have home ownership. And that's another shift where the multifamily space um, is beneficial as an asset class. And so you can see on the chart on the top here, um, and this is just from 2000, uh, like 2020 to 2021, you can see the average sales of a home price increased by about 25% in a year. And um, that's not even counting 2022. And it's leveling out a little bit now because of the interest rate changes. Uh, but again, anytime home prices increase and you know, the biggest thing people fear is recession. You know, but if you look at statistics and even back in 2008, as long as you didn't over leverage your debt and you had good cash flow, you'll ride it through and the multifamily will still be fine. Um, the vacancy, you know, the rental vacancy post COVID, you know, a lot of we got really scared because obviously with our big portfolio and no one knew during COVID, uh, 2020 was a scary year for a lot of us, especially in the multifamily space, as much as we know, like everyone says, it's the most resilient asset class. And that was a true test because when they had the eviction moratorium and we were like, OK, now people may take advantage of that and they may not pay rent. And through 23 properties, I mean, we because the occupancy stayed high and because most of our portfolio was in areas where, you know, it is higher than average household income, most of our properties are A and B class. And so, you know, the lower income properties might have a little bit higher as far as, you know, delinquency. Our portfolio really didn't have much problems with delinquency and people paying. Uh, so physical occupancy stayed high and um, people paid the rent. And our property management team was super good about making, making sure they set up shop at the leasing office, help the residents fill out those who who did really need the aid to fill out the proper paperwork for them. Um, so not many people took advantage uh, of the situation where we had to evict. And actually most of our properties did better during COVID and post COVID. Most of them have actually increased and done better as far as occupancy. So mitigating risk, especially in this environment, um, our next webinar, I'm going to share more in depth on mitigating risk and what conservative underwriting really means. Because when, when you're shown as a passive investor, if you're shown um, performa numbers, they're all going to look good, right? And so unle unless you're educated enough to understand assumptions and how to view a market and the right type of questions to ask. And when you look at an underwriting, what is conservative and what is aggressive, you're just, you don't know what you don't know, right? And so um, the next one, I do wanna actually pull an actual analyzer, underwriting analyzer, and show you different scenarios of just changing one or two things on that underwriting, how much that really impacts the bottom line for the passive investor. 
And so how do we stress test those things? And what does it even mean to be conservative? And so when we do um, stress testing, some of the high level things, um, we want to make sure that the rent growth is not aggressive. So even if hypothetically, like right now, truly in Houston and DFW, we've been getting an average of 18 to 20% rent growth. We would never underwrite for that type of rent growth aggressively. We were still, especially during COVID, we were underwriting a two to 3% rent growth with year one being flat with no rent growth to account for COVID. But honestly, of course, everything is appreciating and the rent growth is a lot higher. And now we're underwriting maybe about three to 4% uh, rent growth um, with a high economic vacancy year one to account for those for us to carry out our business plan. Do not over leverage the debt. I mean, that's the biggest thing in this environment right now. Pre-COVID, most of our debt was with agency debt, uh, which is Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and those are the two big agency debt we were using. Uh, when COVID happened, um, anything, anyone who was acquiring post COVID, most of them and most of us were using bridge debt. And so bridge debt, uh, instead of having a fix, you know, you're gonna have um, a three year plus one, plus one, which means you have options to extend or year three, you can refinance and change out to permanent debt. And so when you're dealing with um, like, um, when you're dealing with that kind of a bridge debt, you wanna buy an interest rate cap. Um, and especially now we try to do, if, if we're able to get fixed debt, especially now, that's great. If we still have to use a bridge debt, we wanna make sure we purchase an interest rate cap and that we don't over leverage our debt. So say for instance, and what I mean by over leveraging debt, say for instance, the lender and the lender underwrites the project. They know the they know that property and they look at the numbers to determine what they will allow you to borrow. So even if they approved us for 75 to 80%, even back then, we would never take the full amount. And especially in today's environment, we would probably take about 65% to max maybe 70 now. Uh, and there's one project we just took that we actually cut it down to even just 62% leverage. And so we, and then we'll raise the rest. And if we underwrite for such where we can, hey, I'm gonna borrow less from them, raise more capital and have an extra reserve, capital reserve for in case of emergencies, um, and the numbers still work out for our passive investors and for us, we're going to stick to those numbers. And if we can get a deal that fits that criteria, then we go for it. And obviously, we're going to lose a lot of deals because we're not going to maximize the leverage and someone else will outbid us. But that's OK. During this environment, it's so important that you cash flow. You have to have enough cash flow to hold the property afloat for worst case scenarios. Number three, the strong team. Uh, with integrity and experience. I think that's really, really super important. Those of you who were, were at SARE, um, you, you heard Perry talk about the importance of having integrity and having a strong team that can really fully tr be transparent with reporting, with communication, whether it's good or bad. I mean, we don't know what's going to happen. Like, for example, the Texas winter storm. You know, Miranda, you just moved to Austin three months ago, but, you know, Texas has weird things. It's, you know, and so we were not, we, I've been here 16 years. Winter storm is not very common, but we had a property in Houston that um, 72 units were impacted because the pipes froze and water pipes broke and 72 units got impacted. Now, if we did not, conservatively underwrite and have extra cash reserves on hand, we would have been in big trouble. And fortunately, because we did have that capital on hand, um, we were able to have them go in immediately, repair those 72 units, put it back in the market. Because if you're sitting there waiting for insurance 
in order to bring those units back into market to rent, you'd be in trouble. But clear communication with your investors that that's what's happening is important, good or bad. If there's a fire, if something's happening unexpected with the winter storm, making sure that we're taking care of and how we're mitigating that. Um, so executing the plan, you know, you have to have a good property management team. You have to have a good asset manager. And so, you know, strong property management team culture, you know, it starts from the leadership down. And so I think the general partnership team, in addition to the property management team, it is a partnership. You know, even though you hire them and you pay them a certain fee, you need to have that relationship with them where you have clear communication and understanding and expectation from both sides so that, you know, we get on a call with the management team every single week. And then we'll have a lead asset manager who's going to be overlooking and deep diving and going out to visit the property to make sure that anything that's been turned uh, the capital X projects are being carrying out to the, our standard of care, you know, quality. Um, and so you want to make sure you treat the on-site team um, as good as you can, because the leasing agent, the manager, the maintenance, they are the core people of your business. And so you can have a great plan and everything, but if the on-site team who's day-to-day taking care of the residents are not doing a good job, you're, you're, you're going to suffer and you're going to see some of that. And so you want to make sure that residents are happy uh, and that great customer service is being provided on site from your team uh, and that you're, you're, you're having a good um, relationship with our, you know, with your management company. And I see, I see that as a problem, even from a passive investor standpoint, when before we went active, you know, some teams just go through management company after management company after management company. And so it's super important that you have a management company that has a strong background and that's not just going cheap. And so the cheapest management company is not you want to invest in people. And so we heavily believe in investing in um, and putting the dollars in investing good teams and investing in good hires and the people. Um, so that's super important right now. Um, but I say, don't get so busy making a living, you forget to make a life. But, you know, with the with multifamily investing, it's been such um, a blessing for us. And, uh, you know, for our investors who a lot of investors, we have investors from really all walks of life. And, uh, you know, most of our deals, there's just so you kind of know, like, how do you get involved? What's the timeline and things of that nature? So the SEC, uh, which is the Securities Exchange Commission, has a 506B and a 506C. And so a 506B means that you do not have to be accredited, but you do need to have a pre-existing relationship with one of the sponsors or general partners, um, and you need to be a sophisticated investor. And a sophisticated investor means that you know the, you know, kind of like what I'm going through here, that you're learning and being educated about the pros and cons and how to evaluate. Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean you have to have already invested, but you need to have basic knowledge of how it works, the risk and the benefits, right? Um, a, an accredited investor, a 506C, means that you can actually go advertise it publicly and solicit or, you know, um, investors. But an accredited investor means that you have to have a net worth of at least $1 million, and that's not counting your primary residence, or you actually have to have, if you're single, you have to make at least 200,000 a year um, for at least two years, or if you're married, you have to make at least 300,000 a year um, or more uh, for a couple of years. Um, and then for 506C, you, you know, we always have a third party company that's actually going to review financials to verify, to make sure you are an accredited investor. A 506B, um, you will just answer if you're accredited or, you know, not accredited. And we will not be asking you for any of your financials or bank statements or anything like that. 
so that but you cannot advertise a 506b deal uh, and so referrals okay or we have to already know you um, but we couldn't blast it out or like just advertise it online on facebook or something like that for that type of deal um, but I'm going to open the floor because I wanted to be a little bit more conversational so that I can have you guys kind of ask questions and whether you're a general partner or you're a passive and you're completely new because you guys have kind of a mixed crowd in here. So I'm going to, uh, but I, I forgot, I, I have this due diligence checklist uh, that we made. So if you're interested in like having, it's a 50 point due diligence checklist of like, what should you even look at? or ask um, as far as breaking down the market, the team, the debt structure. Um, and you can text the word passive uh, to 26786. And we can, it'll automatically, you, you'll be able to get the due diligence checklist. And if you want to schedule a 30 minute call, uh, Maria is our executive director for investor relations. And, she, you know, she can help um, and you can schedule a 30 minute call with us. Um, or you can go on our website to check us out a little bit more, uh, PassiveWealth23.com. But let's stop, share this, and let's get you guys back on so we can interact a little bit and you guys can ask some questions if you have questions for me. But uh, let me see. Are you, I, I think David's still driving. Miranda, you're with your husband there. Um, and since you guys are newer to the space, uh, maybe I can kind of pick on you guys a little bit and see uh, if you have questions for me first. Yeah, well, I think what you like um, shared is super helpful. And uh, like, I think by now we're just, just still at early stage of understanding the lay of land. Um, I don't have any specific question yet, but like, I, I'm sure like once we start looking into deals, I'm probably going to bug you or, or like, like to get more insights or advice. Yeah. Um, you guys would be great to join our next webinar where we're going to actually show you uh, underwriting and go more in depth with the numbers so that you can really see, you know, uh, rent and uh, debt structure and cap rates and like expenses and kind of really show you tab by tab the in-depth underwriting so you could yep. understand a little bit on that side. Okay. Awesome. And um, how do, how do I get on the mailing list of the webinars? Yeah. So you can go on our, um, go on our website and you can fill out the questionnaire on there and then set okay. up a call with Maria. Um, and then um, we can put you on to our, um, our, we use we usually have quarterly newsletters and then you can also have an opportunity if you're interested in future investment opportunities um yeah. we add it to the mailing list awesome thank you Hua. you're welcome and just a quick note um miranda i know that you've gone to the website we've communicated over email i will put my calendar link in the chat if you guys are interested and then when we wrap i'll also send um just a quick wrap-up email along with the link to the recording in the event you want to revisit that information so quick um reminder that you can also text the word passive as paul mentioned to 26786 and then that will immediately start the trickle down of the information including that due diligence checklist. And then I will put the Calendly link in the chat shortly. Um, also a quick welcome to Tal. She joined while you were in progress. So just wanted to say hello. Hi. I will put that. Hi there. Thank you. Hi. Hi, Tal. It was very nice to meet you at the Sarah conference. Um, and yeah, we got to chat a little bit, but um, you were so busy like signing <laughs> books for other people. So I didn't want to take a lot of your time. <laughs> Oh, thank you so much for joining on Tao. And you're in Washington? Yes, I am. Oh. Yeah, Seattle, Washington. So do you currently already have any experience in multifamily yourself? Yeah, so that's actually um, 
I'm having a question for you as I'm hearing all of this. I'm yeah. new to syndication. I haven't invested in uh, syndications before. I have been investing in one, two, four, um, just kind of like doing the Burr method, um, buying and fixing up and renting it out. Um, but then I'm, I'm getting to the point where I'm feeling like it's hard to manage all of these single right. family houses, right? So <laughs> what is the next step to scale? Um, so multifamily came to mind and I'm trying to learn more about it. Um, but um, with, with multifamily, it's like whether I should invest in syndications or going out and trying to do it myself. Um, as I'm, I'm looking, like it was a little bit overwhelming, like talking to a lot of people and seeing what they do just because um, it's new to me. So like analyzing deals and stuff like that, do you have any advice for like, how do I know whether I'm ready to kind of like try to do it myself or like what you say earlier, maybe I should tack along with a syndication to kind of learn it as I go. But then with syndication, a lot of them I see that have the requirements of like, you have to be committed to, um, you know, 50 to 100,000 for like five years, right? So that's kind of like getting the capital stuck in the deal for a while, whereas um, we can use that to like recycle and try to do something else. So I'm trying to see like, is there a way that I can calculate whether one way is better than the other? You know, that's a really good question. And I'll tell you, depending on a uh, long term, if you're able to have that 50 to 100,000 to scale and go larger, you know, one of the things when I first started was I was looking at smaller properties and trying to do it ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I started off at looking at 14. And then when I decided, you know, um, I didn't want to put all that work and I did want to do syndication, uh, the limiting mindset, because when you're thinking like, well, it'll be easier if I just do some smaller units and mm -hmm. then go larger, I will tell you off of my own experience, go larger. If you can join a, a team that's mm. already existing and go larger, my first deal was 243 units. And even wow. if you're a co-GP and it's your first time and you get a smaller equity share, mm -hmm. that small portion I put in, um, Jaime and I put in for our very first deal, uh, we did have a little bit more capital. So we did invest 150. They didn't require us to. Most teams... If you're able to at least bear, you know, put in the minimum, of course, if you can put in more, that's better. Uh, but if you have the capability to raise capital, you know, there's three pillars of underwriting. You know, we talk about the acquisitions, the equity, or the operations. If you're brand new to the multifamily space and you're partnering with an existing experienced team, mm -hmm. the best way to get your foot in the door is to capital raise. You know, and so if you can bring in sweat equity and bring in the ability to raise capital, that's really the best and easiest way to get your foot in the door while you're getting stronger on learning the underwriting and market analysis. If you decide you want to do acquisitions and look for your own deals down the line, but every team, especially on larger projects, needs more capital. And so if you have net worth and liquidity to be able to be a loan guarantor and leverage that uh, even better, if you can help with some of the upfront costs before closing the earnest money, great. But yes, one of the downsides is you your capital is locked in for the duration of the project until you sell on the backside. But you can get quite a bit of money on, you know, when you look at when I, I'm going to make another webinar, Tao. Um, and so we're going to go through the underwriting. And in the underwriting, I'll share with you the potential of what an active GP can make versus what an LP makes. And mm. so how the equity split is, if it's 80, 20, 75, 25, 70, 30, and then you can really calculate, um, you know, if you wanted to go that route, and even if it's a small cut of the pie, you know, what that looks like versus mm -hmm. you doing it by yourself. And that would answer you a little bit more have like, yeah. hey, I bought a five unit by myself. Um, versus if I did a 250 unit deal, but I only got a small share, how did the numbers work out in a five year period? And those that would be eye opening for you to kind of see. But I'm going to tell you the scalability and if, if I would rather a small piece of the pie in a bunch of large deals, leveraging a lot of people doing the work. 
I will do that all day, every day. Okay. Um, but you have to be able to have a skill set to be able to join a partnership team who's experienced. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So so that's my second question. I mean, like I um, I have been looking at a few of the syndications and I mean, they mostly marketing um, opportunities to become LPs. Right. right. Like, I haven't seen a lot of like, OK, you would have the opportunity to actually be a GP. Um, and are those usually coming from like getting to know the 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 ones that are actually doing syndications very well and that's how you get in Um, because for someone new like me um, I don't have a lot of experience like analyzing deals so besides like capital um, I may not be able to like bring a lot to the table right so how do you break in and actually um, like find an opportunity like that yeah so when you first get in the door in the syndication world Um, You do want to pick a sponsorship team and particularly a person who's willing to answer questions and kind of give Mm -hmm. you resources of where you can learn and be educated while you're also being a passive investor. And so, you know, I'm very open to that. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, we don't do the actual education on all of that. We show you some of that. And that's why we're doing the webinars. Mm -hmm. But there are programs where you can learn more of the ins and outs if you want to go active. It is a lot of work. I'm not going to sugarcoat that to be a general partner. But if you can have, you know, a few other partners and divvy up the roles and the workload, and you focus on your strength, um, then that's great. And you, you, you just focus on your strength and doing that part. Because if you're going in and trying to do all, it takes the same amount of work doing a 24 unit deal as it does a 360 unit deal. Yeah, you go through the same process. You know, just you just need a whole lot more money and capital um, when you do the larger projects. Um, and so if you're able to hone in on that, um, being able to build relationships. And at the beginning, it's hard because you're like, well, how am I going to raise capital if I don't even know the business yet? And that's why mm-hmm. when we started, we invested passively in eight deals with mm-hmm. eight different sponsorship teams so we could get to know them. And we dedicated the first year to doing nothing but passive investing and just reading books, listening to podcasts, having programs to help us understand the ropes of the true business, because I was not going to risk raising other people's capital until I knew for sure that it was working and that I trusted the partnerships. And my intentions when I was a passive investor was I purposely picked people that I really knew, like, and trust and wanted to potentially be general partners with. And so most of my general partners who I'm currently partners with are all people that I have passively invested with and have done business with. And I know how they operate and run. Got it. Okay, thank you. That was very helpful. You're welcome. Anyone else? Gigi, I know we only got to chat a little bit. Um, Did you have questions for me? Um, I I do. when you mentioned tax, you said tax, it's um, advantages, right? Advantages. And can you elaborate more on that as far as invest, you know, from our, from the investor standpoint, from the passive investor standpoint, Correct. how is that an advantage? Yeah. And so all of our multifamily projects, we do what's called a cost segregation study. And um, it's an engineering firm that will come out and evaluate. And so with all of these projects, you're going to have a cost segregation study performed and you have bonus depreciation. And the the benefit of it is you get to have accelerated bonus depreciation. So for 2022, you'll still be able to maximize 100% of that. And so most of our projects, we've been getting about 80 to 100%. So say, for instance, if you invested hypothetically $100,000 and the cost seg gives us about 85%, your K-1 on your first year will show a negative 85,000. And so even though you're going to get positive cash flow through year one through until we sell the property, you're going to get positive cash flow 
but you're not going to be paying taxes on that, right? Now, that negative K-1, depending on if you're a real estate professional or not, and most people who are full-time uh, working like you are will not qualify as a real estate professional, right? And so a real estate professional really needs to be in the business where they have 750 hours of material active involvement in a project. And they that the real estate business has to be more than their, uh, any other work that they're doing, right? And so if, if someone is able to qualify the real estate professional and they have a spouse who may have a W-2 job or something like that, then they're able to utilize and offset and maximize all of that the first year against their spouses. However, when you talk to your CPA, because we can't actually get tax advice, we always say you have to talk to your CPA based off your circumstances, but you can, you have your passive loss will offset passive income. And so if you can't utilize it, say that whole 85,000, it will always carry forward. You're not going to lose that, right? And so you'll be able to move that forward. And then when you sell the property, and so what most people do is say, for instance, I'm selling a property, then I'm going to invest in more properties so I can offset some of that, right? So that I can keep deferring the taxes or I can keep lowering that down the line as much as I can. And so most and you know not all teams will carry that down um, and give it all to their passive investors and you know we do and I think most syndicators I know who are good syndicators should pass those benefits down to their um, passive investors as far as how many years it can be carried forward how um, I'll you know you can ask your CPA to be make sure on that how many years, if there's a limitation, but they are going to start tapering down the amount yeah. of bonus depreciation. So 2022 is the last year you can get a hundred percent. And so I was like, why is the best time investing now? You know, yeah. um, as long as you purchase the property and it closes within 2022, you can still use that for 2022. And then for 2023, I don't know exactly what percentage if they're tapering it down to 80% or what now, do you know, Joey, what um, the bonus depreciation is supposed to be for 2023, if they're cutting it down to 80% or what? Do you know? Uh, yeah, 80% is what I hear. Yeah, so that's that's what I'm hearing. So, you know, if, if, if you can maximize that, of course, that's that's beneficial to have. But, you know, for like Jaime and myself, just our personal situation, you know, we're both eye doctors by trade. And so we have two private practices um, one's been 11 years, one's nine years. And so I only work two days a month out of my practice seeing patients now. And so I focus on real estate full time. And Jaime goes into the practice maybe one or two um, days a week. And the rest of the time, he's doing multifamily alongside me. But, you know, the way we have our businesses structured, you know, the tax advantage of advantages of multifamily, you know, we pay zero taxes on our income taxes, you know, of course, there's plenty of other taxes in the business. But our personal income tax, you know, we thought when we first heard about zero paying zero taxes, we really thought that was totally impossible. We're in the highest tax bracket possible. But because of multifamily, we've really been able to utilize that cost segregation um, and bonus depreciation to really push that and defer the taxes. And so we've been paying zero taxes. And so a lot of other, um, other investors of ours who started off as passive investors um, really utilize it because of the taxes. And I have one particular investor, he owns 21 surgery centers and a hospital. He makes too much money and he goes, well, I have a tax problem. Um, and, you know, he's a real estate professional already because he owns a lot of his own commercial buildings and surgery centers and things of that nature. And he doesn't practice any longer. And so multifamily for him was huge to be able to use that, you know, bonus depreciation to offset. And so he was ecstatic to be able to utilize this vehicle to save him tremendous on taxes, you know, and some some wives are real estate professionals and their doctors or, you know, their husbands are uh, or wives or doctors in a hospital, and they're able to offset their W-2 income. So there's lots of different ways. 
And you just kind of have to talk to a CPA, but who's well-versed in real estate um, to help you strategize and plan accordingly. But I hope that helped. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Juan. You're welcome. Uh, David, did you have any questions for me? I know you're driving, but did you have any questions? Um, no, I'm actually okay right now. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Do you mind if I get a glimpse glimpse of your face? Did I did I get to meet you at there? Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Because um, I I just finished driving, so I'm actually back in my uh, I'm back at home now. So let me hold on one second. <laughs> Hi. Oh, there you go. Hey, David. <laughs> How you doing? No, I probably didn't meet you, but um, yeah, I just saw your posts and stuff. So I, I, I just been like interested in the multifamily for a while, but um, I think I, my family's been doing more actively. Um, yeah. I wanted to do more of a syndication down the line because, uh, uh, you know, growing up in that family business, it's like I've seen my parents like actively do it. Like, you know, we do our maintenance ourselves and stuff. So it's not, it's, not fully passive. it's like, oh man, it's like you're hands on with everything, especially when you're on your own property management, like you do everything yourself. Yeah. So, especially with the, oh yeah. Especially in California and, um, you know, just save up all that money. So, yeah. Yeah. But you know, it's nice, even if living in California, when you go into doing a multifamily, you can invest and partner with people in other markets, you know? Yeah. 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 So that's what I was uh, thinking about doing because I've been interested in doing out of state. So, yeah. So yeah. we have a lot of California investors who are investing. Yeah. In <laughs> so, you know, yeah. Texas is a hot market. Phoenix is a hot market. You know, there's a lot of them, Florida, Carolina. Um, Joey, you just said you have a property where? Georgia? Where's Joey? Yeah, in uh, Dallas. In Dallas. In your hometown. In Not yeah. hometown. But. Okay, perfect. Yeah, Dallas. So Dallas, you know, it's, I mean, it's a great, great market. Um, but yeah, you don't have to invest in the market that you live. And that's the beauty of multifamily and syndications, whether you actively or passively invest. Um, you know, you can just leverage and partner with others. And that's you know, if you're self-managing, um, it's still, I mean, like you said, David, and you're, you see your family doing the <laughs> maintenance and doing the work. I mean, it's yeah, yeah. Feel like that. You know? It's okay. I mean, it's fine because like, you know, our properties are local, so it's not like so far, but um, we did, there was a point where uh, I think the traffic getting worse now. So it's yeah. kind of like, oh, damn, <laughs> got to drive so far. So it's kind of like, uh, yeah. But then also um, dealing with the, um, Tenants in California, you have like, you know, it's very protected, you know, for the tenants and stuff. So sometimes there are tenants who really abuse, you know, the laws and stuff like that. So that's kind of pain to fight. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Now, do you have any interest to passively invest too, or you're looking to just be a general partner and coach? Um, yeah, no, I can do passive. I'm, I'm, I work either way. So um, I just try to do like, um, there's, there are things that I'm kind of like actively doing myself and multifamily just passive. Um, I'm doing a little bit of like student housing, okay. stuff like that. So I'm just diversifying my you portfolio, know, all my assets, and yeah, my portfolio and stuff like no, that. That's so good. I mean, diversification is good. You know, we have we started with like single family and land and hotel syndication and Airbnb. Yeah. We're pretty well diversified too. Um, the bulk of it, of course, now is multifamily. Uh, but we're, we're pretty spread out too. But as long as you're in real estate, I was like, just invest in real estate some way or yeah. you know, yeah. just don't over leverage your debt, just make sure, you know, especially during this environment um, that you take that into account. But I was so happy with Sarah that there were so many young people, like from all walks of life. And I was just like, yeah. man, that's great. I wish I got to start at that early. You know, so that's that's really good. But, you know, if you guys um, I don't know if you got the message earlier about, you know, if you want to go to our website or schedule a call with Maria, uh, if you guys are interested in even just uh, newsletters of what's going on in the market or you want to get any future investment opportunities or schedule a call. Um, you can leave it in the chat um, or just hit the Calendly link or whatever way or go on our website. Um, and then you, we're going to be hosting, you know, uh, future webinars. And so if you want to be involved in that, because I want to go more in depth, this is very high level 
I just wanted to kind of do an intro. Um, but in, in the future, I want to go a little bit more deep diving for those who are active or passive. Um, and then if who are active, if you want tips on like how to co GP, um, how to increase ability to raise capital and, you know, finding deal flow and things like that. We can definitely do more on that. And then for my passive investors who are like, hey, I have no desire to be an active partner, then I can just focus in on those webinars for you guys on just the passive side and the proper questions to ask. But still, you need to be educated, you know, either way, um, you need to be able to analyze and be educated enough to make proper decisions before you invest and lock in your, you know, liquid capital for that duration. But uh, any other questions for me? Uh, Maria, do you have anything else? How can I Let be me get off mute here? And um, I saw just a quick note that I did see Tal's and Gigi's request to be included in future webinars. And absolutely. Um, I just wanted to personally thank you guys for finding us on the Zoom and for kind of going through the WOBA. And first of all, for just joining and RSVPing for the webinar. As you can tell, well, uh, is a um, wealth of information and it's good for us to learn from her in this way and being able to have a small forum where we can ask questions, I think is super helpful because we learn from each other, right? They say that um, asking questions is like a pickaxe into somebody else's brain. You know, somebody somewhere knows what it is that you want to learn. And when you ask those questions, that's how we can dig for that goal. So I do wanna thank you for that. When we wrap up, I am going to send over a, a link to the webinar and uh, have you guys revisit that. Again, it was a wealth of information. We're going to be doing future webinars. I think the next one is on the property analyzer you mentioned, Pa. We're okay. going to go through uh, deep diving underwriting. Deep diving underwriting. So there you guys, you heard it here first, all right? Um, but no, thank you again for having uh, the opportunity to join today. I know that you guys could be doing a million and one other things. And we just thank you guys for joining us. Appreciate everyone. Have a good night. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye, y'all.